Good afternoon, Mr. President, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. President, for asking me to address such a prestigious audience. Well, this has been quite a difficult recession. In previous recessions, manufacturing took the brunt, but this time, the recession's main victims are the high street retailers. This recession is high street led. Now, as jewellery is a luxury purchase, you might think that we at Ratners would be suffering more than most. Well, we're not. We're not on the crest of a wave either, but we are coping. And in fact, this morning, you may have read that yesterday we announced profits of £120 million. Pounds. Eight years ago, the announcement we were making then was somewhat different. The company had just, in fact, lost £350,000. So before I talk about the potential for the next eight years, it's important to see how we've achieved this growth. And if there's any tips in my story that may be of help to you, please go ahead and use them. That is, as long as you don't decide to diversify into the jewellery business, because we could uh, certainly do without the competition at the moment. But Ratner's Group is primarily a jewellery retailing operation, with around a thousand shops in the UK and another thousand in the United States. We cover a number of brand names. Our major chains in the UK are Ratner's, H. Samuel, Zales, and Watches of Switzerland. And the theme of today's conference is quality, choice, and prosperity, which I think links quite nicely with our businesses. Zales, the diamond specialist of the group, represents quality. H. Samuel, which operates from much larger units and carries bigger ranges, including jewellery and gifts, represents choice. While Watches of Switzerland, which sells watches, believe it or not, costing as much as a quarter of a million pounds, certainly represents prosperity. So that leaves me with the original chain, Ratner's. And I have to admit, that while it offers choice with its 99p earrings, it's positioned very down market and it doesn't represent prosperity. And come to think of it, it's got very little to do with quality as well. Um, but also, I have to be honest, also in Ratners, uh, we sell gifts as well as jewellery. Things like a teapot for two quid. Um, or we've got this imitation book that you lay on your coffee table. The pages don't actually open, uh, but uh, they have beautiful curled up corners with imitation antique dust. I know it's, you might say, it's not in the uh, best possible taste, but we sold a quarter of a million of them last year. Um, we also do this uh, nice sherry decanter, it's cut glass, and it comes complete with six glasses on a silver-plated tray that your butler could uh, bring you in and serve you drinks on. And it's really only cost £4.95. pence. <laughs> People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. <laughs> um, Uh, it's no point beating around the bush. Anyway, uh, our Ratner's shops will never win any awards for design. They're not in the best possible taste, I admit that. In fact, some people say they can't even see the jewellery for all the banners and posters smothering the shop windows. So it's interesting that these shops, that everyone has a good laugh about, take more money per square foot than any other retailer in Europe. Why? Because we give the customer what they want. In our shops today, jewellery is largely bought on impulse, especially in our Rats, Ratners and H. Samuel divisions. The look of the shops, with pop music playing, 
garish colours and bright lights is worlds apart from the old-fashioned jewellers. Before 1984, Ratner's was one of those old-fashioned jewellers. In those days, nothing in the windows was priced. Today, everything in our windows is clearly priced and clearly described. The old jewellers used to lock the door behind you. They probably bolted them as well when you came in. Now, when our shops are open, you'll see no doors. We take them away. Before 1984, the average item in a jeweller's shop cost over £300. Today, in our shops, jewellery is no longer a luxury. It's about £20 on average. We even sell a pair of earrings for under a pound. Gold earrings as well. And some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencers. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings. But anyway. <laughs> This year, actually, we've got a new line coming out, which is very exciting. We've had it for about six months, and it is a range of men's earrings. And we thought 99p was a great price, so we're still selling them at 99p, even though um, it, there's only one. A man only wears one earring, which was uh, a very good marketing ploy. Uh, and especially as they only wear one, it doubles the profit margin as well, which is, uh, can't be bad. Uh, but I, looking around here today, I noticed that there are very few IOD male members wearing uh, any earrings. <laughs> very disappointed about that. Uh, well, hopefully a lot of you will become more fashion conscious by next year's convention. So, what we have done, in all seriousness, in our market, is to throw out all the sacred rules and customs, however sanctified by time they were. We've broken down the barriers put up by those jewellers who felt that prestige and mystique are what the public wants. The jeweller of old targeted a very small part of the population, the much better off. Jewellery in those days was like air travel or going out to eat. It was a province of the rich. Today, any young teenager can afford to pick up a piece of gold jewellery as a fashion accessory with a new outfit. So our future success will come from continuing to offer the public what they want, not what we want to give them. So what do people want these days? What do they want? At the moment, what they're looking for is new products. Somebody once did a survey, and the most popular word that people looked for on their shopping travels when they went out was actually the word new. And at Ratners and Samuels, whenever we've got anything new, we stick a label on it saying new. Nothing like telling people. So they want things that are new and exciting. And then secondly, they've got to have products that they can afford. A lot of retailers and this probably applies to other business people, are too afraid in this climate to try anything new to beat this recession. They're trying to deal with this recession by walking away from it and hibernating. They hope to survive perhaps like hedgehogs in the winter by getting out of sight and hoping that they are going to emerge totally unscathed and reborn when it's all over. Well, that isn't going to work. You can't do that in retailing anyway. Your shops, your staff, they all need you desperately to be out there continuously with new products, new ideas, new promotions, and all different sorts of schemes. Just because there's a recession out there doesn't mean that we can all stop. Perhaps think of your dog as your, 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 your business as your pet dog. You can't stop feeding it or stroking it or taking it for walks just because you're in hard times. What's going to happen if you don't feed your dog? What is going to happen? It's going to drop dead. Well, the same thing can easily happen to the business. Yes, you've got to be sensible about things and you've got to try to help results by spending less. There's no question about that. 
But business, hibernation, in recession, means death. Death through stagnation. Now, if there's one good thing about this recession, I can't think of many good things about it, but if there's one good thing about it, is that it, you can negotiate with people. Everybody knows that there's a recession going on. So it is possible to cut overheads and cost. But just as we want to save money when we're dealing with suppliers and our shop fitters or who else, our customers also want a bargain. Or at least they want to think that they're getting a bargain because of this recession. They want to feel that they can virtually steal something from you. And quite honestly, the only way that you can get people to buy anything in this climate is to make sure that they know that they're going to get a good deal, a great deal. Our offers are genuine. If they weren't, the customer would soon find out and leave us. The easiest thing to do in this climate to combat this recession, the simple answer, is to just lower prices. But where's that going to get you? It doesn't get you anywhere. If your margins go down, you'll suffer. The answer is to get more out of your suppliers or more out of them than you actually pass on to your customers in those deals, which means close cooperation with them, discussing innovation and new design, and helping them to achieve efficiency in production. Right now, our customers not only want lower prices, they're very demanding. They also want free offers, something for nothing. We're in the age today of the value-added consumer. My wife, sitting in the front row, seems to be more interested in the gifts she gets than the actual perfume itself. It's the add-ons that seem to count at the moment. The lowest ticket price on its own is just not enough to keep the punters happy. At Ratner's, we've been successfully running a voucher scheme. A £50 voucher if you spend £150. Sounds good, doesn't it? Now that really sounds also like a 33% discount, which of course, from our point of view, would be suicidal. In fact, though, it's not a 33% discount, because if somebody's spending £300, they would still only get one voucher. So the average spend that qualifies for a voucher would be more or less around £200. That immediately lowers the discount from 33% to 25%. But we're not handing out £50 notes. It's a voucher. And that voucher costs us somewhere in the region of about £25 because we make double-up margins. And we don't give the stuff away. Uh, so that immediately brings it down to 12.5%. Now, the customer can't redeem that voucher immediately. So when they return, they usually buy something which costs more than £50. On average, we get something like an additional tenner, which is not much, but it's better than nothing. That's an extra £5 profit, which saves us a further 2.5%. So now we're down to a 10% discount. Some people lose their vouchers, or they don't bother to redeem them. So now we're down to 9%. Still coming down further. We also calculate that before vouchers, 25% of our customers who spent over £150, used to ask for a 10% discount anyway. Now, instead, we give them a voucher, which reduces it by, I hope you can follow this, by, by a further 2.5%. So you end up with not a 33% discount, but a 6% discount. And that's good marketing. And we found sales, incidentally, over the Christmas period that were over £150, that when we ran this promotion, that those sales increased by, it turned out, so it turned out that it was a very, very profitable promotion because they increased by some 50%. Now, I know it's a rather complicated explanation, and if you don't follow, you didn't follow all those details, I don't really mind because you can work out your own scheme. But look what, and there are plenty of others, but look what else we're giving the customer, as well as the vouchers. Interest-free credit, 0%. Free insurance, 30-day money-back guarantee. If they change their mind, for whatever reason, we'll give them a full refund. That's how confident we are about our prices. 
Now, with 34% of the market, you may wonder why we're trying so hard. You think we've got a monopoly. It's because we're not only competing with the other jewelers out there, but with everyone else in the high street for what is a shrinking disposable income. And how can any of our competitors or any of the other jewelers compete with that? So this is Ratner's answer to this recession. Give the customer such a brilliant offer that they can't refuse it. Yes, it's market trading, I accept that. But have you ever seen a street market that's empty? It's this approach, a simplistic approach, but it's this approach that has taken us from under 2% of the market to 34% of the jewellery spending today. I hope there isn't anybody here from the Monopolies Commission. I don't think there is, so I'm OK. Now, of course, there are other things that you have to do, and there are other things we do. We have a very speedy stock replacement system. It's essential when somebody comes into the shop that we actually have the item they want. I know it's obvious, but it's crucial. And then it's important that we motivate our staff. Our staff in Ratners are all on incentive schemes, where they earn money purely based on what they sell. But what has really made the difference for us was that we have taken the mystique out of jewellery. We market it just like baked beans, or like anything else, and probably even more aggressively. Now, aggressive marketing has to be carried out all the time, but it's not the only action to be taken, particularly during a recession. We also have to manage costs. You must make your operation lean. No one likes reducing stuff, and we certainly don't. It means hardship for the people we make redundant, but unfortunately, if business is tight, it's sometimes unavoidable. I believe, however, that it's better to reduce the number of your staff than the money that they are paid. This recession is a challenge to them, and you want to keep the people who can respond to that challenge. So we try not to reduce pay or privileges for existing staff. In addition to managing costs, we also have to manage the group's liquidity. We have successfully implemented major reductions in stock, and we make sure today that we only buy what we sell. We do not carry excess stock in the warehouse, and this is achieved by monitoring sales on a daily basis, the just-in-time approach. But for all our controls and cost cuttings, they're all done in a manner to ensure that they won't affect sales. And whatever we're doing, we communicate with our staff. We have frequent meetings with our managers, we get their opinion, and we tell them of our strategies. Now, one question that we used to ask ourselves is what are we going to do when we hit our 50% target, 50% market share in the UK? Could we transport our formula to the continent or the United States? Otherwise, we'd be in danger of getting into the law of diminishing returns if we didn't go abroad. In the UK, the jewellery market has grown faster than any other sector in the high street, and that's mainly because we have made it more affordable and more fashionable and certainly more high profile. When we did consider the continent, we had one advantage. We'd already been there. Ratners had expanded back in Europe in the 70s. We'd opened about half a dozen shops in the summer of 1974 in Holland. And they actually did quite well that summer. The problem was, when Christmas came around and the figures didn't go up, we discovered that they don't celebrate Christmas in Holland. Which, uh, they don't, was a slight drawback, you know, they don't give Christmas presents. And as 90% of the jewellers' profits are made in December, that was an enormous drawback, to say the least. Perhaps this is an extreme example of not researching your market before you go in, of not looking before you leap. But that is the sort of mistake that is going to be made again in 1992. And it isn't enough to research new markets, you've got to know your market. We know the jewellery market in the UK pretty well. 
We don't know everything about it, but we think we know more than our competitors. And that's the only basis on which you can be successful in any market. So we decided to go to the US before Europe, as it is the largest market for jewelry in the world. It's a market worth some $22 billion, five times the size of the UK jewelry market. So in the US, we acquired a chain which appropriately was called Sterling. We decided it was the best jewelry retailer in the US. It wasn't the biggest, just the best. And because rents in the US are linked to sales, you can actually find out who is taking the most money. You can find out what every trader is taking. The mall owners are quite happy to tell you that. Unfortunately, they don't do it here because sales are not linked to rent, so they don't know. So we traveled around the malls, and without any exception, Sterling was taking more money than any other jeweler. That's pretty useful information to know when you're buying a new business. So we thought at that point, we'd, uh, we'd go and visit them in their head office. And we also found that their gross margins were 61%, higher than the UK even, if that's possible. And that was the highest in the trade. Their bad debt write-off, because everybody buys everything on credit, was the lowest. Totally crucial as far as the US is concerned. Everybody wants everything on credit. They don't want to pay. All of this plus first class management. And in the four years since we bought that business, we've never regretted it. We've used their proven methods, we have built on their foundations, and we've expanded their operation tenfold from 100 to 1,000 shops. Last year, we made $110 million in the US. That is more than any UK retailer has ever achieved there. And we know that this was due to the fact that we weren't arrogant enough to try and transport our formula, however successful it was in the UK, straight across to the US. We got local management to deal with it. And that's the secret. Yes, we've had criticism on the way. We bought Kay's, a company, a jewellery company in America last year, a chain of 500 shops. The city analysts, won't say too much about them, but they gave it the thumbs down. The press unanimously condemned it. There were even calls from institutions for us to appoint non-executive directors to the board. And our shares halved in price. Apart from that, it was very well received. The thing that none of them yet understand is that just like all our previous acquisitions in the United States, and we've done five, they've all been successful, K's will totally be transformed and converted to that successful sort formula. It was just a property deal. And it's worked for our previous acquisitions, and it's already working, I'm glad to say, for K's. And our shares are beginning to go back up again. So we have used the 80s to expand our businesses. We've taken full advantage of the economic climate. I accept that. In the 90s, we were capitalizing. We want to capitalize on our position. So to sum up, whether we're in the US or the UK or the continent of Europe, whether we're in recession or we're in a boom, we'll carry on being prosperous by taking market share. To do this, we will continue to offer value for money. That's central. We must go on offering the widest possible choice from the best locations, operated by staff who know what they are doing and who are fully trained. We must give the best service and project the highest possible quality standards. In other words, we must show the customer that if they want jewellery, we're the place to come. We're the only real choice they've got. We, we're what the Americans call category killers. The 90s will certainly be tough for all of us, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone, I think, agrees about that. There'll be more lo losers than winners. The winners will be the ones, in my view, will be the ones that can control costs without losing innovation. The winners will be the ones that can find a way of blending the two. We are totally determined that the winners will include Ratners. We all share this recession together. 
And I hope that before long, we will also share good times. So good luck for you, for your staff, and for your companies. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, thank you very much indeed.